Let's talk about molecules and bonding. How do molecules actually form? Well, a molecule is just made up of two or more atoms. They can be the same, two of the same atom, or they can be different atoms of different elements bonding together. There's two basic types of bonding that occur to make molecules. Covalent bonding is when atoms are going to share electrons. And ionic bonding is when the electrons are actually getting transferred. So one atom is giving an electron or more to another atom. We'll talk about more about why atoms would share or transfer electrons in just a little bit. But the Bohr model explains how electrons behave. Um, it, it projects what may be happening in atoms. So as I mentioned before, electrons are constantly in motion. And we know that they don't have, they don't all have the same energy. They, they reside in different energy shells. But what we're interested in today is bonding because this is what makes molecules. And bonding is always determined by the electrons that exist in the outer shell. And we call that outer shell the valence shell. The reason that chemical bonds form, either covalent or ionic, is simply because atoms desire to have their outer valence shells filled. So in the first energy shell, it is full with two electrons. The second energy shell is full with eight electrons. And as we move out in energy shells, it's either eight or more electrons from that point forward to fill the valence shell. But every atom desires to have its valence shell filled. Now, if we look at the periodic table, one thing I want to point out to you is you can tell about the valence electrons of an atom based on where they exist in the periodic chart. So this first group right here all has the same structure in their valence electrons. Okay, they're group one, and as we'll see in just a minute, they have one electron in their valence shell. I'm going to talk about a couple of other groups, and that is this one here, group 18. These have a full valence shell, and they're called um, inert, which means then they're called inert gases because they don't react. They're inert. Okay. Sometimes they're called the noble gases. And the reason that these are inert and don't react is because they have a full valence shell. They don't need to bond with other atoms. They already are satisfied with their full valence shell. Now, if we look at the group just next to the noble gases, this group here, these guys have seven electrons, uh, or this one does, has seven electrons in its valence shell. As you move down, every one of them is going to be lacking one electron in their valence shell. They just need one more electron to be happy and complete. Now let's talk about covalent bonds and we'll look at some examples about how covalent bonds occur. So as I mentioned, these are bonds occurring between atoms that are actually sharing electrons. And a good example of that is water. So we're gonna go through an uh, example of how water covalently bonds. There are more than one type of covalent bond. There's both polar and nonpolar covalent. Let's look at water first. We'll take oxygen and we're going to put the electrons, we're going to fill the electrons in their shells. So we need to know how many electrons does oxygen have. Well, here's oxygen. And we see that the atomic number for oxygen is eight, which means there are eight protons. And for an atom from an element that's electrically neutral, that means there are eight electrons. So we have to fill these electrons in their shells. Oops. So let's say in the first shell around oxygen, we know that this first shell is filled with two electrons. So we'll place two electrons in the first shell. And then in the second shell, we only have six electrons left to place. And so we will put one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, oxygen is not happy 
because oxygen doesn't have a full valence. This second shell would be full if it had eight electrons. So along comes hydrogen and another hydrogen. And let's look at hydrogen. Hydrogen here has one proton, one electron. So we will only have one shell, which happens to be the valence. It is the only shell, it is the outer shell. And that one electron goes in that shell. Well, in this first shell, it would be full if it had two electrons. However, it doesn't, it only has one. But what happens here is that hydrogen and oxygen can share a pair of electrons. And when they do that, they both get credit for both electrons. So if oxygen gets to count all six of its electrons, plus these two from hydrogen, now it has a full valence. And the same goes for hydrogen. It counts its electron plus the one that it's sharing with oxygen. That's two that fills the valence for the first energy shell. So this is why water uh, is a molecule formed by sharing electrons because it works to fill the valence electrons of these atoms. Now let's talk a minute about what I mean by polar covalent and nonpolar covalent. Every atom has a certain affinity for electrons. And by affinity, I mean how closely they hold those electrons. There's a term that describes this, and it's called electronegativity. Okay, so this is an atom's affinity or pool for the electrons. The more electronegative an atom is, the more tightly they're going to hold on to the electrons. The less electronegative, the more that they are likely to give up electrons. So you can think about in a covalent bond, the electrons are always shared. Okay, that's the definition of a covalent bond. But sometimes they're not shared equally. So if you think about tug of war, and in a tug of war, there's the knot in the middle of the rope. And as it's pulled back and forth from either side, if you have an uneven matchup, and so that knot stays closer to one side than the other, that would be like the polar covalent bond, where one atom is more electronegative than the other. Therefore, it keeps the electrons more of the time and doesn't allow them to be shared equally. With water, what happens is that oxygen is very electronegative. Hydrogens are not nearly as electronegative. So these two electrons that are shared between oxygen and hydrogen actually spend much more time. Remember, they're in motion. They're not a stationary static thing. They spend much more time around oxygen than they do hydrogen. Well, it doesn't create a charge. It's not an ion. However, it makes the oxygen molecule partially negatively charged because it gets the electrons which are negatively charged more of the time. It makes the, the area of the molecule where the hydrogens are present partially positively charged. Okay, it's not charged, it's just got a partial charge there. And that's because the hydrogens retain their positively charged protons all of the time, but they don't retain their negatively charged electrons all of the time. It's shared more, it spends more time around oxygen. So that's a polar covalent bond. The nonpolar covalent bonds are a lot easier to, to imagine. That is when the two atoms that are sharing the electrons have essentially very similar or the same electronegativity. So any diatomic molecule, meaning two atoms of the same that are bonded together, like two oxygen atoms bonded to form oxygen gas, those would be nonpolar, equal sharing, no partial charges. Let's move on to ionic bonds. In an ionic bond, you actually have an electron or electrons that are given from one atom and taken by another atom. So there are, there's no sharing going on here. We have a complete transfer. And when that happens, what is formed are ions. So we have a cat ion, which just think the T looks like a plus sign. So that makes it the positive ion. And we have anions, which are the negatively charged ions. 
Sodium chloride is an excellent example of something that is uh, an ionic bonded molecule. So let's look at this. So we have sodium, and based on this description, is giving one of its electrons to chlorine. And what I want you to see is the reason that this occurs is that sodium is not nearly as electronegative as chlorine. Chlorine is very electronegative, but also look at if this shell is sodium's valence shell, it has one electron in its valence. If it just loses that electron, now this shell becomes a valence and it's a completely full valence shell. Chlorine, on the other hand, has seven electrons in its valence shell. It just needs one to be happy and have a full valence. So by accepting this electron from sodium, it has a full valence shell. Now let's look at the periodic chart just so we can see where sodium and chlorine, chlorine lie on the periodic table and we can look at how do we determine that they actually have one valence and seven valence electrons. Okay, so sodium we see here has an atomic number of 11. Chlorine has an atomic number of 17. We have 11 electrons because 11 protons, 11 electrons, and we have 17. So remember, if we fill, all they're showing us is the valence electron for sodium. But if we, if we drew all of the shells of sodium out here, the first shell would have two electrons because it's full with two. Okay, we still have nine left out of that 11. So the next shell would have eight. Okay, that's only 10 electrons. We have one more. And this is the valence shell that you see with the one lone electron. So as sodium gives this electron up, the valence shell now is this second shell, which is a full valence. Let's do the same thing for chlorine. Okay, we have two that fill the first shell, and then we have eight. That brings us to 10, which gives, leads us to our valence shell that has seven. And by accepting this electron from sodium, now chlorine or chloride has a full valence shell. But when this happens, this creates these, these ions that I mentioned to you, a cation and an anion. This is a cation and this is the anion. And the cation is positively charged anion is negatively charged. How do I know that those are the charges on sodium and chloride? Well, sodium is still going to have 11, whoops, 11 protons, which is 11 pluses in the nucleus, but it no longer has 11 electrons. It gave one up. It only has 10 electrons. So there are 11, I don't know why I keep writing an H, 11 positive charges and only 10 negative charges 11 minus 10 is plus 1, so it's a cation with a plus 1 charge. We would write this sodium plus. That indicates that it is a positively charged ion. Chlorine had 17 positively charged protons. It started with 17 electrons, but it gained an electron, so it gained a negative. So we have 17 minus, now we have 18. So chlorine or chloride, excuse me, is written this way. But as you, when you write them together, just NaCl because the charges there cancel one another. It is the attraction of the charges of the ions that hold the ionic bonds together. So remember, covalent is a shared bonding, and ionic is due to transfer that causes these positively charged ions, and then opposite attracts, opposite attract, opposites attract, therefore creating the bond. The last thing that I want us to cover today is a specific characteristic called hydrogen bonding.
And in this case, we're going to look at how hydrogen bonding occurs in water. So this here is one individual water molecule. We looked earlier at how water molecules become molecules, and these are covalently bonded molecules, all three of these water molecules. The hydrogens are covalently bonded to the oxygens. So this line here represents a shared pair of electrons. This is the shared pair of electrons between the hydrogen and the oxygen. Now, the hydrogen bond is this bond here shown by a dashed line. When you, when you think about bonds, the very strongest bond is the covalent bond. Next would be the ionic bond. And way down here, much, much weaker, would be the hydrogen bond. It's a very weak bond. In fact, it's broken and made all the time. But that doesn't make it an unimportant bond. The, the, the bonds are, play a very important role in the characteristics of life, in water, and you'll look at those later in the semester. Let's talk about this hydrogen bond. What's going on here? What this means is, this is an attraction of one water molecule, so it's the whole molecule, to another. Notice that the water molecules are already covalently bonded. It has nothing to do with the covalent bonds within each individual water molecule. But we also said that water molecules are polar covalent, meaning the electrons are not shared equally. So this part of the molecule is partially negative. This part is partially positive. In this molecule, partially negative, partially positive, partially negative, partially positive. What happens is the partially negative part of the water molecule is attracted to the partially positive portion of another water molecule. It's this attraction that is, in fact, the hydrogen bond. So a hydrogen bond is an attraction between a hydrogen, so let's say this one here, that is already covalently bonded to an electronegative atom. In this case, the electronegative atom is oxygen. It's between the hydrogen and another highly electronegative atom, which in this case is also oxygen. It happens to belong to another water molecule. Hydrogen bonding doesn't only happen with water molecules. We'll see it that it also occurs in proteins and in uh, nucleic acids, but it also makes some very unique and important properties for water.